टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट द टॉपिक ओरल हैबिट्स व्हाट इज अबिट हैबिट इज नथिंग बट ए टेंडेंसी टुवर्ड्स एन एक्ट विच हैज बिकम ए रिपीटेटिव परफॉर्मेंस रिलेटिवली कंसिस्टेंट फिक्स्ड एंड इजी टू परफॉर्म बाय एन इंडिविजुअल सो ए हैबिट इज नथिंग बट ए रिपीटेटिव एक्टिविटी which has become a part and parcel of the life of an individual where he is able to perform it in a very easy manner and the, the, the activity occurs in a consistent and fixed manner in that particular individual so this is a habit a habit might be a good habit or a bad habit as you all know you all are, you all are aware of what are the different kinds of good habits and bad habits in the daily life of an individual now the habit has been def defined by different authors in different manner according to moyers habit is nothing but a learned pattern of muscle contractions which are complex in nature that means habit is nothing but a learned pattern where a complex muscle contractions occur this is according to moyer whereas according to finn a habit is an act which is socially unacceptable this is the definition provided by finn what finn says is a habit is a major concern for many of the individuals why there are two reasons number one is it leads to oral structural changes that means any kind of abnormal oral habit will lead to alteration in the balance of the orofacial musculature leading to damage to the oral oral structural development thereby they, it leads to abnormal oral structural changes and the second concern of an habit is a uh, behavior problems okay so whenever a patient or an individual performs an abnormal oral habit it is not so socially acceptable and the society around us think that the behavior of this person is in a abnormal way so the behavioral problems and oral structural changes are the two main concerns regarding any kind of abnormal oral habit according to finn now habits are classified into different kinds by different authors let us look into those classifications the first classification is according to morris and bohana according to these authors a habit can be a pressure habit non pressure habit or a biting habit whereas according to clean a habit might be an intentional or a meaningful habit or non intentional or a meaningless or empty habits okay that means there lies an intention under one habit whereas another habit goes unintentionally according to finn the habits can be further classified into compulsive or non compulsive habits whereas according to william james we can classify habits into useful habits and harmful habits so this is the classification of oral habits we have seen various classifications proposed by various authors about habit now let us list out what are the various abnormal oral habits that can be seen in in, in an individual digit sucking or thumb sucking or finger sucking we call it as pacifier sucking tongue thrusting lip biting habit mouth breathing cheek biting frenum biting bruxism nail biting masochistic habits that are self trauma inflicting habits tongue sucking clutching uh, sorry clenching and occupational habits so these are different kinds of abnormal oral habits that can be seen in an individual of all these habits of all these habits the major habits or the habits which have major influence on the orofacial structures are thumb sucking or digit sucking habit tongue thrusting habit mouth breathing habit and bruxism we will be dealing with these important oral habits and their effects on the orofacial structures in a detailed manner let us first look into the digit sucking habit many people will be having or many children will be ha having the habit of sucking a digit either it be a thumb or in index finger or uh, index finger and middle finger whatever it is so there are varying uh, degrees of sucking habits 
Now, what is a digit sucking habit? According to Gelin, the definition of digit sucking is it's the placement of thumb or one or more fingers in varying depths into the mouth. So this is the definition of digit sucking habit. Now, actually this digit sucking can be seen in the intrauterine life. By means of digit sucking, the child attains a feeling of euphoria, euphoria, a sense of security and a feeling of warmth association and being wantedness. That means, the, by the habit, the child obtains a positive feeling of security and pleasure and warmth and the child gets the feeling that he is being cared by someone. So, during the childhood, up to three and a half to four years of age, the thumb sucking habit is said to be a normal phenomenon. It is not taken as an abnormal habit. But if it extends beyond these four years of age, then it will be considered as an abnormal deleterious oral habit. Okay. Now, let us look into the etiology behind the thumb sucking habit or digit sucking habit. Various authors have proposed various theories regarding the thumb sucking habit. Let us look into these things one by one. The first one is Freudian theory by Sigmund Freud. As we all know from the psychology, from the theories of psychology, the Sigmund Freud's psychosexual or psychodynamic theory of psychological development says that a child passes through different stages during the course of development and during this developmental process, a child will pass through stage of oral phase or and anal phase. Okay during first three years of life in these stages in the oral stage the area of uh, erotic zone is mouth the area of oro erotic zone is mouth the child will be ha having a habit of keeping everything in the mouth it might be an object or finger whatever it is okay now if uh, an, if the parent or a guardian tries to stop the habit of placing the, uh, the object or fingers in the mouth of a child, then the child assumes a feeling of insecurity. He will be landed, he, he will land up in a stage of emotional stress and this feeling of insecurity will, you know, will, uh, will create a, a inbuilt drive in the child to repeatedly place digits in the mouth and suck for feeling of security. So, according to Sigmund Freud, the oral stage of development, psycho, uh, psychological development, is marked by mouth as an oroerotic zone. The child will be having tendency to keep either any external object or any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of uh, things or finger or digit in the mouth in order to satisfy his oral erotic zone. Any attempt to wean this habit or any attempt to, uh, you know, stop the child from putting the objects in the mouth during this period will lead to a tendency of insecurity in the child. This will become a deep-rooted uh, kind of reflex in the child's mind and the child will land up in continuous sucking of the thumb or digit. So this is the reason behind digit sucking according to Sigmund Freud. Now, the second theory was proposed by Sears and Weiss. This is called as oral drive theory. This theory says that it is not the frustration of weaning that is seen as a, a digit sucking habit as said by Sigmund Freud. Rather, the oral drive in the child due to prolonged feeding Will, uh, will remain as a digit sucking or thumb sucking habit in the child. So, it's not the prevention of or weaning of the, uh, it's not frustration of weaning that, uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, that gets rooted as a digit sucking habit. Rather, prolonged nursing, prolonged feeding will lead to digit sucking habit according to Sears and Weiss. Yet, we have one more theory called as Benjamin's root reflex theory. In, a, in an infant, particularly in mammalian inf infants, 
when you try to touch the cheeks or the area around the mouth of a child either with the you know pacifier or either with finger or any object the child will try to turn the head towards that object and tries to suck it so deep rooted uh, rooting uh, so the deep seated rooting or placing reflex in the child will exhibit itself as a digit sucking or thumb sucking habit usually this uh, reflex will disappear within 7 to 8 months of age but persist persistence of this uh, rooting reflex will lead to development of a thumb sucking or digit sucking habit according to Benjamin now yet we have another hypothesis called a psychological aspect children deprived of parental care are more prone to become insecure and start digit, digit sucking habit due to lack of emotional a lack of emotional stability some at some say that digit sucking is just a common learned pattern there is no specific etiology under digit sucking habit so these are varied etiologies behind the digit sucking habit now let us look into how to diagnose a habit digit sucking habit and uh, what are the things that we should look after uh, look into in order to diagnose a digit sucking habit the first thing is we have to take the history of digit sucking habit then we should evaluate the child's emotional status we should examine extra orally and intra orally now in the history we should ask for the frequency uh, the duration of the sucking and the intensity of sucking so all these three aspects will give you the degree of trauma or damage to the oral structures that are uh, that can be happened with uh, with the severity of sucking so we have to record about duration frequency and intensity of digit, digit sucking habit in order to assess the amount of uh, damage that has been occurred to the orofacial structures so the more severe the more frequent and the prolonged duration of sucking the more will be the damage that occurs to the dentition and orofacial structures in the extra oral examination we should examine the digits lips the facial form and other features when we examine the digits the patient will be having a clean dishpan thumb it is characterized by reddened exceptionally clean and chapped digits with a short fingernail this is called as a uh, dishpan thumb or clean dishpan thumb and you can see fibrous callus on the dorsum of the thumb when we examine the lips the upper lip will be short and hy hypotonic and the upper lip will be passive and incompetent during the swallowing process when we look into the facial form you can have a mandibular retrusion maxillary protrusion high mandibular plane angle that means lower anterior facial height will be increased due to lowering of the mandible when the patient or, or when the child keeps the thumb in the mouth and convex profile for you can see facial grimace or excessive mentalis muscle contraction during swallowing in the patients having digit sucking habit and we should examine for whether the tongue, tongue is placed normally or is placed in a forward position between upper and lower teeth because there will be occurrence of anterior open bite in the patients having thumb sucking habit and in order to perform the lip seal the patient might sometimes place the tongue also in between the teeth with, which you should note down and keep it in your uh, k-shaped performer so that you can even address those things apart from digit sucking habit also and you should examine the facial profile of the patient obviously the facial profile will be convex because of downward and backward rotation of the mandible and you should check for any speech problems that are associated with the with the that, that are associated with the malocclusion that occurs in response to digit sucking habit and due to pressure of the index finger on, on the nose you can also see a saddle saddle nose so you should also check for this feature in a patient having digit sucking habit now apart from checking only for digit sucking habit you should also inquire and check if at all the patient is having other concomitant oral habits like mouth breathing habit and tongue thrusting habit in the intra oral examination we should examine the tongue dento alveolar structures gingiva 
and we should look into tonsils whether they are enlarged or not. We should examine the correct size and position of the tongue in resting position. And you should also see the tongue action during swallowing. And you should look into the dentoalveolar structures. You can see flared or proclined maxillary anteriors, whereas retroclined mandibular anteriors due to thumb pressure during sucking. You can also see midland diastema and buccal prospect due to narrowing of the maxillary arch. As the mandible rotates downward and backward in response to thumb sucking habit, there will be unopposed action of the buccinator muscle on the maxilla leading to constriction of the maxillary arch. As the maxillary arch becomes constricted, you can see a crossbite in the posterior aspect of the dentition in patients having digit sucking habit. And even as the mandible rotates in a downward and backward direction, you can also notice open bite in the anterior region and obviously the palate will be narrow and high, vault, high vault or deep palatal vault in case of patients having digit sucking habit. So you should make a note of all these features that you can see in a patient with thumb sucking habit and you should address it in your treatment plan. Now if you look into the gingiva, uh, you can see excessive staining on the labial aspect of the upper central and lateral incisors. If at all a patient is having a concomitant mouth breathing habit along with thumb sucking habit and you can also see a gum line etching in a patient having concomitant mouth breathing along with thumb sucking habit. So those are the different aspects that you should look into when you, when you have a patient of tongue twisting habit and you should make a note of all the findings in that particular patient. Now what are the treatments that are available for a thumb sucking habit? Number one is psychological therapy and number two is reminder therapy and number three is mechanotherapy. When we look into psychological therapy, we have two aspects, positive reinforcement and Dunlop's beta hypothesis. What is a positive reinforcement? Positive reinforcement is nothing but, you know, it's like, it's, it's like uh, giving a pleasant stimulus to a person so that, giving a pleasant stimulus to the individual so that the response which is negative will become a positive one. That means, uh, reinforcing the child about the negatives, negative aspects of the uh, thumb sucking uh, habit or showing the features that can, uh, that can occur in that particular individual if the habit is continued. That means we are positively, you know, uh, guiding the child to stop the habit. We are strengthening his mindset to stop the habit. This is called as positive reinforcement. Whereas what is Dunlop's beta hypothesis? It's nothing but ask the child to sit or stand in front of the mirror and continue the habit of thumb sucking repeatedly. So the awkwardness or the negative aspect of the habit itself will be reflected onto the child's mind by this process and the child will himself stop the habit of thumb sucking. This is called as Dunlop's beta hypothesis. Now, the second uh, type of treatment that is available for thumb sucking habit is reminder therapy. Okay, you can apply a bitter agent onto the surface of the thumb like pepper, quinine, or asafoetida. Asafoetida uh, that is very bitter, and whenever the child tries to suck, uh, he will feel the bitterness of the chemical, and the child will gradually stop the habit. And one more thing is by bandaging the thumb and the elbow so that we are mechanically restricting the child from placing the thumb into the mouth. So these are different kinds of, you know, even you can uh, wrap a, a cloth or bandage around the thumb of the child so that he will not get that pleasure of the sucking. And you can also apply a bitter agent like asafoetida or quinine or you know pepper can be applied onto the thumb or the bandage that is tied around the thumb so that whenever the patient or child tries to suck the thumb you can feel the bitterness and he will eventually stop the habit. Now there are some intraoral appliances that can be used to uh, prevent the habit of sucking like you can use a parietal crib 
with rakes or spurs. This can be incorpor incorporated in a hollow appliance or they can be fabricated in a fixed manner. So that every time the child tries to place the thumb into the mouth, the spikes or the spurs will prevent the placement of thumb into the oral cavity. As you can see, fixed maxillary tongue grip can also be used in order to uh, prevent the child from placing the thumb into the oral cavity, thereby eliminating the habit completely. The next abnormal oral habit that is considered is tongue thrusting habit. According to Moyers, in a child, we have infantile swallow. This is called as jaw apart swallow with the tongue coming between the gum pads. The mandible at this stage is stabilized primarily by the muscles of facial expression. Uh, sorry, the muscles, yeah, the muscles of facial expression which are supplied by the seventh cranial nerve. Now the swallow is guided to a greater extent, controlled by sensory interchange between the lips and the tongue. Okay. So this is you now gradually. This infantile swallow will undergo a stage of transition to a mature swallow once the upper and lower incisors erupt. So, during the childhood or infancy, we have something called as infantile swallow where the tongue comes to lie between the upper and lower gum pads to establish lip seal. At this stage, the mandible is stabilized by the muscles of facial expression which are supplied by the 7th cranial nerve. With the eruption of the upper and lower anteriors, deciduous upper and lower anteriors, the tongue that is usually placed between upper and lower gum pads will gradually adapt itself to be placed just behind the upper central incisors in the region of palatal rugae. So, this kind of transition from infantile swallow to the mature swallow takes place. Now, what are the characteristics of the mature swallow? In the mature swallow, the teeth are together and the mandible is stabilized by the muscles of mastication which are supplied by the fifth cranial nerve. And the tongue tip is held against the palate above and behind the incisors and there will be minimal contraction of the lips during mature swallow. So, the transition from infantile to mature swallow usually occurs in many individuals. In some individuals, the transition from infantile to mature swallow will be absent or missing which will lead to persistence of infantile swallow which we call it as a tongue thrusting habit. This infantile swallow is also called as a uh, visceral swallow whereas the mature swallow is also called as a somatic swallow. Now, what is the definition according to Schneider? According to Schneider, tongue thrust is a forward placement of the tongue between anterior teeth and against the lower lip during swallowing. This is the definition of tongue thrusting habit. Usually it occurs due to absence of transition from infantile to mature swallow. Now, again there are number of theories proposed by many others to notify the etiology of tongue thrusting habit. Some say it's a genetic factor. Some say it's just a learned behavior habit, but there are some predisposing factors for thumb, uh, sorry, tongue thrusting habit. Let us look what are those. Like improper feeding can lead to tongue thrusting habit. Prolonged tongue, uh, uh, prolonged thumb sucking habit can also lead to tongue thrusting habit. Prolonged tonsillar and upper respiratory tract infections can also predispose an individual to tongue thrusting habit. Prolonged duration of tenderness of gum or teeth will also lead to tongue thrusting habit and tongue held in open spaces during mixed dentition will persist as a tongue thrusting habit particularly the lateral tongue thrusting habit. So these are different predisposing factors to tongue thrusting habit. And lack of maturation of the infantile swallow will also lead to tongue thrusting habit. And in cases where the tongue size is large or the dental arches are constricted or the adenoids are enlarged, we can also see tongue thrusting habit in such patients. And some neurological disturbances and psychological factors are also responsible for tongue thrusting habit. Now, 
we have certain classifications of tongue twisting habit by different authors according to brander and holt we have our tongue twisting habits as type 1 type 2 and type 3 type 1 is it's a non deforming tongue twisting habit whereas type 2 is deforming anterior tongue thrust whereas type 3 is deforming lateral tongue thrust Again, type 2 and type 3 habits are further subclassified into subgroup 1, 2, 3, subgroup 1, 2, 3, both in type 2 and type 3. In subgroup 1 of type 2 tongue thrusting habit, according to Brander, we have anterior open bite. Subgroup 2 shows anterior proclination, whereas subgroup 3 gives, uh, shows posterior cross bite. Similarly, in type 3 tongue thrusting habit, in subgroup 1, we have a posterior open bite in subgroup 2 we have a posterior cross bite and in subgroup 3 we have a deep cross bite okay and we have a type 4 according to Brenner or Holt where it is called as deforming anterior and lateral tongue thrust that means it's a more complex one type 1 is a more simple tongue thrust whereas type 4 is a more complex tongue thrusting habit again in type 4 tongue thrusting habit also we have a sub subgroups 1 2 3 subgroup 1 shows anterior and post posterior open bite subgroup 2 shows proclination of the anterior teeth whereas subgroup 3 shows posterior cross bite okay this is a bit complicated or complex classification now we have a, it one more simple classification we can have two types of tongue thrust habits according to this classification one is simple tongue thrust and another one is a Complex tongue thrusting habit. Now, what are the features of a simple tongue thrusting habit? In a simple tongue thrusting habit, we have a normal tooth to tooth contact during swallowing. That means teeth are not apart, rather, teeth are together during swallowing. And we have a only simple anterior open bite in this kind of habit. And there is a good intercuspation of the posterior teeth in simple tongue thrusting. The tongue is thrust forward during the swallowing to help to establish an anterior lip seal and we have an abnormal mental muscle, mentalist muscle activity and prognosis is excellent in cases having simple tongue, tongue thrust so this is called as uh, you know teeth are together tongue lies between upper and lower anterior teeth contacting the lips and we have a simple anterior open bite there is a good intercuspation of the posterior teeth and there is an abnormal mentalist muscle activity during swallowing and the prognosis is excellent in patients having simple tongue, tongue thrusting habit. Now, what are the features of a complex tongue thrusting habit? In a complex tongue thrusting habit, it's called as teeth apart swallow. The teeth will be apart during swallowing. There is no contact between the teeth during swallowing. And the anterior open bite can be diffuse or absent. And we can see absence of Temporal muscle constriction during swallowing in cases of complex tongue thrusting habit. Contraction of circumoral muscles is seen during swallowing and the occlusion of the teeth may be poor. That means poor intercuspation can be seen in such cases. And this complex tongue thrusting is very difficult to treat. So those are the characteristic features of simple and complex tongue thrusting habits. Now, what are the clinical features in patients having tongue thrusting habit? We have a proclination of the anteriors resulting in increased overjet, generalized spacings between the teeth and maxillary constriction. Now, when we see the mandible, we can see usually, usually we can see proclination of the mandibular anteriors. We, usually, you won't see retroclination of the mandibular anteriors in cases of uh, tongue thrusting habit we can see proclination of the both upper and lower anteriors and spacings between the upper and lower anteriors and in cases of simple tongue thrust we can have anterior open bite whereas in cases of complex tongue thrust we can have either an anterior open bite or posterior open bite or a combination depending upon the complexity of the tongue thrusting and we can also see a uh, cross bite relationship of the posterior teeth because the tongue will be pushing the mandibular teeth outward which will lead to a cross bite tendency so this is a image of open bite and spacings that you can see in the cases of tongue thrusting habit now coming to the treatment 
we have to train the patient to correctly swallow and position the tongue during swallowing by different kinds of exercises exercise like uh, single elastic swallow double elastic swallow okay and the child is asked to place the tip of the tongue in the rugae area for 5 minutes and then swallow this should be done repeatedly and this is a method of training the tongue to swallow uh, training the tongue to swallow in an in a normal manner so the first step the basic step in correcting the tongue thrusting habit is training the child to swallow normally by this method and one more exercise is orthodontic elastic and sugarless fruit drop exercises okay and series of exercises like whistling resetting the crown from 60 to 90 will help the help to train up the tongue to uh, into a normal swallowing pattern now we can also see some appliances like nans palatal arch appliance bluegrass appliance or we can also use a tongue crib in order to restrict the tongue okay tongue crib is used to restrict the tongue whereas bluegrass appliance is used to train the tongue into a normal swallowing pattern speech therapy can also be given to the patient like correct position of the tongue asking the uh, individual to pronounce the tables of sixes okay simple multiplication of sixes or tables of sixes and pronounce the words beginning with s this is a means of training the tongue to be positioned normally and we can also come for uh, we can also opt for a, a fixed mechanotherapy either the fixed or removable appliances having a uh, okay crib as i told you before either we can give a fixed tongue crib or a removable hollis appliance with the tongue crib which will help the tongue to restrict which will prevent the tongue from coming into between the upper and lower anterior teeth it's a mechanical mechanical process of restraining the tongue from being positioned abnormally during swallowing okay the next important habit is bruxism what is the bruxism according to ramp jord bruxism is the habitual grinding of teeth when the individual is not chewing or swallowing that means during non functional period a repeated grinding of the teeth is called as bruxism bruxism is of two types diurnal bruxism which occurs during daytime whereas nocturnal bruxism or nighttime bruxism which occurs during night time now the etiology behind the bruxism might be psychological factors like emotional stress occlusal discrepancies like premature occlusal contacts due to restrictions with uncorrected high points pericoronitis and periodontal inflammation or periodontal pain so this will lead to constant grinding of the teeth when the patient is not actually in a mastication process or a swallowing process this is called as bruxism and the etiology is these factors psychological occlusal discrepancies and periodontal pain or pericoronitis when we look into the clinical features of bruxism the patient will be having occlusal wear facets on the teeth you can clearly see the wear facets on the occlusal surfaces of the teeth due to repeated grinding of the teeth and unexpected fractures of the restorations on the teeth can be seen and you can see unexpected mobility of the teeth due to bruxism so these are the clinical features of bruxism you can also see tenderness and hypertrophy of the masticatory muscles due to constant hyperactivity of the masticatory muscles you can see them tender and inflamed and you can see pain in the muscles when the patient wakes up in the early morning because of constant hyperactivity of the masticatory muscles when a patient gets up early in the morning he can feel pain in the muscles of mastication and there will be pain and discomfort to the tmj and repeated headaches in the patient and grinding and tapping sounds can be noted when the patient sleeps okay when the patient sleeps you can actually see the grinding and tapping sounds usually this can be felt by the individual who is beside the individual but not the individual who is having this habit okay now we can also see small ulcerations or ridging on the buccal mus mucosa opposite the molar teeth because of trapping between the occlusal surfaces of the molars you can also see the ulceration or you know trauma to the mucosa of the cheeks now 
In order to diagnose Parkinson, we have to take a careful history, go for clinical examination and electromyographic uh, examination of the masticatory muscles and occlusal analysis to detect any kind of occlusal prematurities. Use of temporary bite planes or occlusal sprints to achieve muscle relaxation, relaxation uh, to diagnose the occlusal trigger factors of the bruxism. So these are the important things that we have to do in order to diagnose a case of bruxism. When coming to the treatment, we have to correct the psychological factors as well as the occlusal prematurities. Okay, both the disturbing etiological factors has to be eliminated to completely or for radicular treatment of the bruxism. So, some of the treatment options include psychotherapy, auto-suggestion and hypnosis and relaxing exercises and physiotherapy. And we can go for occlusal therapy by advising occlusal splints and we have to eliminate the occlusal prematurities before we advise occlusal splints to the patient. These occlusal splints are also called as night guards. So by using these things, one is by psychotherapy to eliminate the emotional stress and by occlusal therapy by eliminating the occlusal prematurities and advising night guards to the patient, we can treat a case of bruxism. Other methods of treatment of bruxism include biofeedback, acupuncture and electrical methods. The next important abnormal oral habit is lip sucking and lip biting habits. Habits that involve manipulation of lips and perioral structures are termed as lip habits. Again, the lip habits can be classified into wetting the lips with the tongue and pulling the lips into between the teeth, according to Schneider. So, any kind of manipulation of the lips and perioral structures is called as lip habit and this habit might range from just wetting the lips and perioral structures to pulling the lips and perioral structures into between the teeth. Etiology for a lip habit might be, it might be just a learned habit or due to an emotional stress or due to a malocclusion. For example, if a patient has a severe buccal crossbite, either maxillary or mandibular, then there are chances that the soft tissues might be trapped in between the teeth during mastication. So these are the etiologies behind uh, lip habits. Now, what are the manifestations of the lip habits? The manifestations might be protrusion of the maxillary incisors and retrusion of the mandibular incisors, hypertonic and redundant lower lip. That means the lip will become thick and hypertonic. And you can also see cracking of the lips. That means you can see fissures kind of appearance on the lips that are being uh, bitten by, uh, or that, that are being sucked or bitten by the patient himself. And you can also see an accentuated mentholabial sulcus in patients having lip habit. Now what are the treatments for lip habits? One is correction of malocclusion which is the etiological factor for lip habit and treating the primary habit by positively reinforcing the patient and reducing the emotional stress of the patient and by using appliances like lip bumper or oral shields which can place the lips away from the teeth so that they cannot be pulled and bitten by the teeth. So these are the different treatment modalities that are, that are available for lip sucking or lip habits. The next important abnormal oral habit that is of major concern is mouth breathing habit. According to Sassoni, mouth breathing habit is nothing but habitual respirations that occur through mouth instead of nose. That means Respirations through mouth is called as mouth breathing habit according to Sassoni. According to Merli, the term oronasal breathing is given instead of mouth breathing. Okay, these are the different definitions of mouth breathing habit. Mouth breathing habit can be classified into anatomic, obstructive and habitual by Finn. What is obstructive mouth breathing? That means there is obstruction in the nasal passages because of which the patient will shift to breathe through the oral cavity rather than through the nasal cavity. When we look into the etiologies behind the obstructive habit, etiologies might be allergic rhinitis or allergies, chronic infections of the 
uh, upper respiratory tract and physical obstructions of the nasal passages like enlarged turbinates or turbinate hypertrophy or nasal polyps kind of things okay now airway obstruction may be due to extra nasal causes this is according to robbins so the obstructive habit might be due to obstructive nas nasal uh, more breathing will be due to allergies or physical obstructions or chronic infections according to robbins the airway may, might be obstructed due to extra nasal causes and in intranasal causes what are the extra nasal causes of obstruction of the nasal passages one is depressed nasal fractures where the fracture of the nasal bone will cause the uh, bony plates of the nose to be depressed thereby uh, minimizing the capacity of the airway passages narrow nasal bridge depressed tip of the nose and collapsed la and thick columella that means all the external factors that reduces the capacity of the nasal passages will lead to nasal obstruction when coming to intranasal factors it might be septal deviation chronic allergic rhinitis non allergic rhinitis neoplasms nasal polyps coenal atresia and coenal polyps these are the different causes that underlay uh, nasal obstruction which are intranasal in origin now when coming to the nasopharyngeal factors hypertrophied adenoids nasopharyngeal angiofibromas and other neoplasms of the of the nasopharynx will also lead to obstruction of the nasal airway which will lead to shift of the breathing from nose to the mouth and other miscellaneous causes of obstruction are like foreign bodies or rhinolids or overuse of local uh, medications of rhinitis so these are the different etiologies behind the obstruction of the nasal airway now the next kind of mouth breathing habit is a habitual mouth breathing habit what is a habitual mouth breathing habit here the habit is continued in the individual even after elimination of obstruction then the habit is said to be a mouth breathing habit in some case in some patients even after elimination of the nasal obstruction also the patient continues to breathe through the mouth as a habitual process this is called as habitual mouth breathing now the third type of mouth breathing is anatomic mouth breathing here in anatomic mouth breathing we have a short upper lip because of which there won't be complete closure of the mouth which will lead to constant breathing of the air through the mouth this is called as anatomic mouth breathing now whatever might be the etiology behind the mouth breathing well whether it be anatomic mouth breathing habitual mouth breathing or a obstructive mouth breathing the clinical features are long and narrow face because whenever the patient tries to open the mouth for breathing the mandible will be rotated in a downward and backward direction and there will be an opposed action of the buccinator muscle which will lead to constriction of the maxillary arch and the maxillary arch will become narrow even the nasal passages will also become narrow as the maxillary arch becomes narrow there will be posterior cross bite and mandible will be permanently rotated in a downward and backward direction and the facial profile will be convex and the overjet will be increased and the incisors will be flared the total uh, facial appearance will be changed in a patient having a mouth breathing habit this is called as adenoid face or long face syndrome even due to constant uh, opening of the mouth while breathing we can have a marginal gingivitis in the anterior gingival region we can also have a dryness of the mouth because of which you can see increased caries increased incidence of the caries in patients having mouth breathing habit and you can see anterior open bite and nasal twang in the voice and the external nares will become small this is called as disuse atrophy because constantly the patient is breathing through the oral cavity the external nares nares will become small as a phenomena of uh, disuse atrophy and we can also see a 
gummy smile excessive exposure of the gums whenever the patient smiles these are the features that you can see in a patient with the mouth breathing habit now how to diagnose a patient having mouth breathing habit we have to take a careful history and clinical examination of the patient and we need to perform some clinical tests to diagnose the mouth breathing habit here there are here uh, some tests are mentioned number one is mirror test a double sided mirror should be placed in front of the patient's mouth one mirror will be facing towards the nasal cavity and one mirror will be facing towards the oral cavity in a patient having a mouth breathing habit the mirror which is facing towards the oral cavity will be fogged or you can see a haziness on the surface of the mirror on a oral side whereas the mirror on the nasal side will be clear second test is butterfly test you can make cotton roll in the shape of the butterfly and you can place it just beneath the columella of the nose so one knob of the butterfly shaped cotton will be against one nostril and another one will be at the nostril so ask the patient to breathe in and breathe out we can see the uh, movement of the butterfly shaped cotton towards and away from the nostril as the patient breathes in and breathes out if the patient is a nasal breather if the patient is a oral breather you can't see the motion of this uh, cotton roll then you can see whether there is a blockage in the nose or not and whether the patient is a mouth breather or not and no, next exercise is water holding exercise ask the patient to hold the water in the mouth and stay quiet for some time if the patient finds difficulty in holding the water in the mouth for a long period of time then you can uh, diagnose then you can conclude that the patient is having a mouth breathing habit because of prolonged stay of water in the mouth the patient can't breathe sufficiently through the nose so he will be having a tendency to spit the water so this is one of the methods of uh, diagnosing a mouth breathing habit now we can also go for air flow measurement through the nasal cavity like reno manometer reno manometry it's also called as uh, inductive plethysmography so this can be done to assess the amount of volume of the air that is flowing through the nasal cavity if it is less than optimal then you can see that there is a blockage of the nasal passages which will lead to shift of the patient from nasal to oral breather and uh, you can diagnose a uh, mouth breathing habit you can also assess the uh, adenoids the size of the adenoids on lateral cephalogram and you can see the uh, the width of the nasopharyngeal airway on the lateral cephalogram and you can diagnose whether the patient's airway is patent or compromised which will lead to diagnosis of a mouth breathing habit now coming to the treatment of mouth breathing habit the treatment should be aimed at elimination of the cause that means elimination of the obstruction we have to refer the patient to ENT surgeon so that nasal passage is completely explored visualized and any obstruction can be successfully relieved now once the nasal obstruction is eliminated the habit should be intercepted by means of using vestibular screen we should not go for vestibular screen completely closing the oral cavity initially we should have some holes in the vestibular screen uh, to allow the mouth breathing habit that means abruptly the patient can't stop the mouth breathing habit we should provide vestibular screen with certain holes in it gradually step by step we should start closing the holes one by one that means we are shifting the pattern of the breathing from oral to the nasal that means a more any mouth breathing habit should not be uh, completely stopped at a time gradually we should make the patient habituated to the nasal breathing slowly as i told you like providing the holes in the uh, vestibular screen and gradually closing the holes one by one till the patient's respiration pattern will be shifting from oral to the nasal one now once the habit is intercepted you have to correct the malocclusion and you have to expand the maxillary arch which is constricted and you should eliminate the crossbite that means not only in the mouth breathing habit in any kind of abnormal habit whether it be a thumb sucking tongue thrusting lip biting mouth breathing whatever it is there is alteration in the muzzle balance that means 
the dentition and orofacial structures which are under under the influence of balanced muscle forces will be altered that means any kind of abnormal oral habit will lead to alteration in the muscle balance leading to abnormal dental and orofacial structural relationship so in managing any kind of habit your main aim should be elimination of the etiology behind the habit controlling or completely eliminate eliminating the habit and then treating the malocclusion that has resulted due to the abnormal oral habit this is a comprehensive treatment plan for any kind of patient presenting to you with a abnormal habit first eliminate the cause or eliminate the etiology behind the habit number 2 is eliminate the habit itself and number 3 is correct the malocclusion that has resulted due to this abnormal oral habit clear so that was our explanation regarding different kinds of abnormal oral habits that can be seen in an individual their etiology their diagnosis and management protocol of different abnormal oral habits hope you all understood thank you